Tonight, we're going to begin in Job chapter 4 and do our best to make it all the way through the next four chapters, because what we want to consider is first the uh, speech of one of Job's friends named Eliphaz, and then Job's response to that speech. And those two speeches, this one from Eliphaz and Job's response, that takes up four chapters altogether. Now, I I want you to notice tonight, as we begin going into this section into the book of Job, that we're beginning a long section where Job's friends counsel him and he answers them. His friends speak in more or less three different rounds with each speech followed by a reply from Job. At the end of all the speeches, God answers Job and his friends, and then he settles the matter. That's basically the rest of the book of Job. But we remind ourselves how we got here, right? We're introduced to this man, Job, a very godly man, a very blessed man. And yet Satan insisted that if only his blessings could be taken away, then Job would curse God instead of blessing God. And in two different sort of stages, God allowed Satan to take away the blessings that Job enjoyed. First of all, the blessings of all his material wealth, then the blessings of his 10 children, then the blessings of his physical health, then you might even say the blessing of comfort from his wife. All of that was taken away from Job. And at the end of chapter two, Job is sitting uh, outside the city dump on an ash heap. There surrounded the smoldering fires, which actually, as we discussed before, was a fairly sanitary place to be because even though it was in the dump, the the fires kept things somewhat sanitary in the sense that that there weren't a lot of bacteria. There wasn't a lot of of things that could, could make Job's physical situation worse with infection. But as Job sat there, three friends came to him, and for an entire week, they just sat there in sympathy with Job in silence which was really an amazing and a wonderful thing. These friends sitting with Job in the midst of his agony, just empathizing with him. And at the end of that week, Job couldn't take it anymore, and he spoke. To say he spoke is an understatement. He wailed. He ranted. He raved. We remember that from last week, right, when we studied Job chapter 3. This was the anguished cry of Job's heart describing the agony that he was going through and how he wished he had never been born. Or if he had been born, he wished he hadn't died when he was a few days old. And he just said, God, I don't understand this. I wish it was all over. I wish I were dead. And at the end of it all, there's a pause. Now in chapter four, one of Job's friends, a man named Eliphaz, is going to speak. So now we pick it up here, verse one. Then Eliphaz the Temanite answered and said, If one attempts a word with you, will you become weary? But who can withhold himself from speaking? Surely you have instructed many, and you have strengthened weak hands. Your words have upheld him who is stumbling, and you have strengthened the feeble knees. But now it comes upon you, and you're weary. It touches you, and you're troubled. Is not your reverence your confidence, and the integrity of your ways your hope? I get the feeling that after this anguished outpouring of soul that Job had, as is recorded in chapter 3, his three friends were just a little shocked. They were like, whoa, Job, settle down. What's this coming from? And this idea first comes from this man, Eliphaz the Temanite. And we know that Eliphaz was from Teman, which was an Edomite city, that was well known as a center of wisdom. It's actually mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 49. And he begins his little speech by saying, if one attempts a word with you, will you become weary? It's a very tactful beginning, isn't it? Now, Job, please, may may I just have a word with you? And you may say, and I might think as well, that this man, Eliphaz, has earned the right to speak to Job. He earned his right to speak to Job by sitting with him in faithful, friendly silence, supporting him for all those seven days without saying a certain thing. It was a remarkable display of friendship. He sat wordless with Job through a whole week to show his sympathy and his brotherhood with this afflicted man, Job. But now, after hearing Job speak in chapter 3, by the way, later on, Job is going to get sick and tired of his friends. 
He just can't hear him anymore. But I think his friends had every reason to say, but Job, you started it. You started it back in verse, uh, back in chapter three. You're the one who spoke up first. We're just answering what you have said. And that's why he says here, but who can withhold himself from speaking there in verse two? You see, life has felt compelled to speak. His love and concern for Job strongly motivated him to help his suffering friends. Now, I need to point out something to you right from the beginning. Keep it in the back of your mind. Okay, number one, keep in the back of your mind that what God said about Job in Job chapters one and two was true. Job really was a blameless, righteous man. And all these things that have come upon him, they did not come because God was punishing Job or correcting him for some sin, right? That is not the reason why. Second thing I want you to remember is that Job's friends were wrong. At the end of the book, I hope I'm not spoiling the end of this for any of you, but at the end of the book, God rebukes Job's friends. And he says, you were wrong. So keep this in the back of your mind as we go through that Job did not suffer because he was sinful and that Job's friends were wrong. Okay, now look at what he says here in verse three. Surely you have instructed many. Now it comes to you and you're weary. Eliphaz began to confront Job with what he saw was his problem. Now it took a great deal of courage on the part of Eliphaz to do it. He was the first one to speak. I mean, I kind of imagine it in my mind if I'm making a movie of it. Job finishes his rant. There's sort of an awkward silence. <laughs> his three friends clear their throat a little bit. They make eye contact one with another. Well, are you going to say something? Well, I don't want to say anything. Are you going to say something? And they look back and forth, you know, in that way that, that guys do together in a group. And then finally, Eliphaz has the courage to speak. And he says, Job, listen, you have instructed many, and now it comes upon you and you're weary. Listen, Job, I, I want to point out the apparent contradiction in your lament. This man who had taught and comforted many people in their time of need, now you seem to despair in your own time of need. Oh, brother, how many times have you come right along somebody else and said, hey, brother, trust God. Hey, brother, God loves you and has a great plan. Don't despair. How many times have you done that? And Job, you should just listen to your own advice. Don't you hate that? Don't you hate it? Because it's true, isn't it? How much easier it is to give advice than to actually take it unto yourself, even when you know it's right. But listen, even though there was an element of truth in what Eliphaz said, it didn't apply to Job in his specific situation. Look at what he says here uh, all the way now into verse 6, where he says, Is not your reverence your confidence? This has the idea of, Job, doesn't your despair show that you've lost confidence in your reverence. You've lost hope in the integrity of your ways. You, you see the fact, Job, this bothers me that you're so shaken that you let out such a wave of emotion as were, was recorded in chapter three. Job, you, you seem to be too shaken. You, you should just be trusting the Lord, brother. You shouldn't be feeling this so painful. You, you shouldn't be undergoing such a crisis here, Job. It surely can't be that bad. That's the essence of what Eliphaz is saying. Now, this begins a section where Eliphaz and the other two guys will try to make Job see that his problems have come upon him because of some sin on his part, and that he should confess and repent of his sin in order to be restored. It's almost as if Eliphaz is saying to Job, Job, listen, don't worry. Just confess your sin. Repent. God loves you. He'll bring you back. He'll restore you. Let's just do this. Again, I want to remind you, that Eliphaz began on the basis of Job's complaint, as mentioned in chapter 3. He reasoned that Job would not complain this way unless in some way he was guilty. And the guilty conscience was the root of his suffering. Now let me remind you, this was a false assumption. He heard somebody pour out of his heart this agonized cry that we just read in chapter 3 last week. And Eliphaz said, you know what? No man is in that kind of agony unless he's got sin in his life and he's got a bad conscience. Now listen, isn't that true sometimes? Yes, it's true sometimes. But it was not true in Job's case. Job's complaint 
was simply the cry of a life in pain and not because Job consciously or unconsciously understood that he deserved the calamity because of some sin on his part. So now he's going to go on here, verse 7. He's going to start to explain what he thinks the source of Job's problems is. Here we go, verse 7. Remember now, who ever perished being innocent? Or where were the upright ever cut off? Even as I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. By the blast of God they perish, and by the breath of his anger they are consumed. The roaring of the lion, the voice of the fierce lion, and the teeth of the young lion are broken. The old lion perishes for lack of prey, and the cubs of the lioness are scattered. Okay, you get kind of the poetic feel of what Eliphaz is saying, but you didn't miss the message, did you? He starts right out with it there in verse 7. Who ever perished being innocent? Eliphaz came to the heart of his argument pretty early. He boldly said that Job was guilty of some sin because the innocent don't suffer the way that Job has. And the upright are not cut off the way that Job was. Now, in this context, cut off means to be forsaken by God and goodness. Later on in Israel's history, cut off would mean to be executed for a certain sin. But that's not the idea here. It just means to be forsaken by God. And so did you notice what he said? It's actually very remarkable. I want to read you verse 8 again. Even as I have seen, right? Yeah, I know all about this, Job. Let me tell you all about it. Even as I have seen, those who plow iniquity and sow trouble reap the same. You understand what he's saying there? Job, let me share with you from my experience from what I have seen. You reap what you sow. Job, you are reaping trouble, therefore you must have plowed and sown sin. You've plowed iniquity, you've sown the seeds of trouble, therefore you are reaping trouble. Now what do we make of that? Is that true or false? That you, you reap what you sow. That, that, that many people have troubled lives, it's because they've sown trouble. The counsel of Eliphaz is full of common sense, and it's rooted in his own observations and experience. We might say that it is mostly true and that it can be commonly seen as true. Nevertheless, we know that in Job's case, he was wrong, and this was the wrong counsel. Now, many people today believe the counsel of life is, and they believe it as an absolute spiritual law instead of a general principle. And what's the one passage that many people quote? You know, right? Galatians 6, 7. I'll read it for you. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, that will he also reap. Now, look, when you read that passage from Galatians, you better understand the context of Paul's statement. The context of it was that it was an encouragement and an exhortation for Christians to give materially for the support of their ministries. It's true that the principle of Galatians 6-7 has application beyond giving and supporting teachers and ministers. It has a general application in life, right? But wouldn't you say that generally in life, whatever you put into something, that's what you get out of it? Right? We see it at our Bible college all the time, right? You see, some students come, and you know what? They just don't take it very seriously. They don't apply themselves to their studies. They don't really care about their classes. And what do you know? They didn't have much of a great experience at Bible college. But then you see other ones. Man, they're into it. And they say, I'm going to get everything out of this that I can. I'm going to put a lot into it, and I'm going to get a lot out of it. You, you, you can take the same principle to exercise, right? You put a lot into it, you'll get a lot out of it. If you don't put much into it, you won't get much out of it. Yes, th this is sort of a general principle that we understand in life. But yet, it's important for us to understand that the Apostle Paul, nor the God who inspired him, neither one of them tried to promote some law of spiritual karma that ensures that we will always get good things when we do good things, or we'll always get bad things when we do bad things. If there were such an absolute spiritual law, you know what it would mean? It would mean we're all going to hell, right? 
if you reap what you sow is an absolute spiritual principle, then we're all going to hell. Because I tell you right now, the work of, that's been given to me by the grace of Jesus Christ goes beyond you reap what you sow. And that's the grace that he shined out upon my life and your life. Paul simply related the principle of sowing and reaping to the way that we manage our resources before the Lord. He also used the same picture in 1 Corinthians 9 and in 2 Corinthians 9. Now listen, Job and his friends had built their whole life on the belief that God helps the good people and God hinders the bad people. They, they, they believed that God can be seen as morally good in the affairs of men. And therefore, they look at Job's situation, what do they say? They say, well, Job, you must have sinned. There's no other conclusion. You reap what you sow. You've sure reaped a lot of trouble. You must have sown it somewhere. And that's why he continues on. Notice this in verse 9. By the blast of God, they perish. You see here, Eliphaz is clearly, clearly implying that Job's suffering came as the judgment of God against him, as the breath of God's anger burned against Job. And then he goes on about how strong the anger of God is. The, the anger of God is so strong that the teeth of the young lions are broken. I guess teeth of young lions are pretty strong, but the anger of God is so mighty that it can break their teeth. Now he goes on here, verse 12. Now a word was secretly brought to me, and my ear received a whisper of it in disquieting thoughts from the visions of the night when deep sleep falls upon men Fear came upon me in trembling, which made all my bones shake. Then a spirit passed before my face. The hair on my body stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern its appearance. A form was before my eyes. There was silence. Then I heard a voice saying, very interesting here, right? He's describing some sort of, you know, night vision that he had, some sort of spectral thing that came. He received this word in a dream when deep sleep falls upon men, as he says there in verse 13. And when the sleep fell upon him, now he's going to go on and say, well, look, this is what it told me. Here comes the revelation from this dream that I had, supposedly from God. Here he goes, ready? Verse 17, here's the message. Can a mortal be more righteous than God? Can a man be more pure than his maker? If he puts no trust in his servants, if he charges his angels with error, how much more those who dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, who are crushed before a moth. They are broken in pieces from morning till evening. They perish together with no one regarding. It does not their own ex excellence go away. They die even without wisdom. I think really the key statement is there in verse 17. Can a mortal be more righteous than God? You see, Eliphaz here is calling attention to the common sinfulness of man. The idea is very clear. Job, we all sin. There's no great shame in admitting that you've sinned and that this is why this calamity has come upon you. Do you see Eliphaz coming along, Job? Job, Job, please, come on, man, look. We're all sinners. You can't be more righteous than God. Just admit it. Just admit that you're a sinner. Just admit that this is why all this calamity has come upon you. And by the way, he says here, very interesting comments that were meant to point out man's spiritual and moral frailty. When he talks about the angels here in verse 18, if he puts no trust in his servants, if he charges his angels with error, isn't that interesting? I find it very interesting because without knowing any of the dynamic here, he's making a reference to satanic and demonic beings, right? And that was what was behind all of this. It's like Eliphaz is blindly poking about for the answer to Job's problem. And by accident, he came very close to the solution here, didn't he? By accident, he came very close to hitting the target. Satan himself, who was the real cause of Job's calamity. Now here, he's saying, listen, he charges his angels with errors. Now, I have to say, and let me repeat this from Alexander McLaren. He makes a great statement. He says, the speaker seems serenely unconscious 
that he was saying anything that could drive a knife into the tortured man. He is so carried along with the waves of his own eloquence and so absorbed in the stringing together of the elements of an artistic whole that he forgets the very sorrows which he came to comfort. You see, already Eliphaz is bringing no comfort to Job. Now he thinks he is. He thinks he's doing Job a great favor, right? Because in the way Eliphaz's, Eliphaz's, Eliphaz's mind is ordered, there's an obvious reason why Job is suffering, why he is. And therefore, just solve the problem, Job. Repent of this particular gross sin in your life that has caused this calamity and everything will be okay. Well, he continues on here, starting at verse one. Call out now, is there anyone who will answer you? And to which of the holy ones will you turn? For wrath kills a foolish man and envy slays a simple one. But I have seen the foolish taking root. But suddenly I cursed his dwelling place. His sons are far from safety. They're crushed in the gate and there's no deliverer because the hungry eat up his harvest, taking it even from the thorns and a snare snatches their substance. For affliction does not come from the dust, nor does trouble spring up the ground. Yet man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. Now you have to say, here Eliphaz is, is getting mean. Did you see that in verses one and two? Check it out here. He says, wrath kills a foolish man, in verse 2. His sons are far from safety, verse 4. Yeah, whose sons were far from safety? Don't you see here a not very veiled reference to the tragic end of all of Job's sons? His daughters too, of course, but it was his sons that he lost as well. Eliphaz argued that the fact that such great disaster came upon both the father and the sons proved that they were if that they were foolish and in sin. Now, I want you to notice Eliphaz's frame of reference. Did you notice there? It's at the beginning of verse three. I have seen. Job, we all know how these things work. I know this. You know, regard me as an expert here, Job. He's so confident in his own wisdom and in principles that generally are true that he cannot see that they do not apply to Job's specific situation. I think it's also very fascinating what he says there about affliction there, verse six, for affliction does not come from the dust, nor does trouble spring from the ground. Eliphaz believed that this trouble did not come to Job from nowhere. It didn't just spring up from the ground. What's the clear implication? This affliction came upon Job from God. Look, you know what? In a limited way, we could say that he's correct, right? Certainly God allowed it to come upon Job. Job himself said the Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. But listen, here's the point. It did come at least through the hand of God, if not from the hand of God but it came for a completely different reason than Eliphaz. Wonder about it. Now, now you understand how wonderful it is that we have those first two chapters of the book of Job, right? Where we see the real reason, the real heavenly drama going on behind the curtain. We can understand what was going on in a way that it was impossible for these participants to understand. And so he says here, yet man is born to trouble as the sparks fly upward. In verse 7, really beautiful, poetic, clear speaking. But, but this point connects with the one that Eliphaz has just made. Trouble doesn't just come to man from nowhere. It comes as a judgment of, from God, or at least because man has sown trouble, so now that he reaps it. Just as true it is, is that sparks fly upward, so it is true that man is born to trouble. And so this is the whole situation. Now, going on to verse 8, notice here a slight change in Eliphaz's um, strategy or, or speaking reference. He says, but as for me, I would seek God. And to God, I would commit my cause. Who does great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number? He gives rain on the earth and he sends water on the fields. He sets on high those who are lowly and those who mourn are lifted to safety. 
He frustrates the devices of the crafty so that their hands cannot carry out their plans. He catches the wise in their own craftiness, and the counsel of the cunning come quickly upon them. They meet with darkness in the daytime and grope at noontime in the night. But he saves the needy from the sword and from the mouth of the mighty and from their hand. So the poor have hope, and injustice shuts her mouth. Now let's see. Eliphaz said it tactfully. He said it politely, but he still said it. It's very clear there in verse 8, right? You got the whole point of it. But as for me, I would seek God. What's the clear implication? Job, you're not seeking God. Listen, I, I, I don't want to get too far ahead of myself. But I'll tell you what Job's response to this would be. I'd say, Eliphaz, I am seeking God. God is hiding from me. The problem isn't that I'm not seeking. The problem is that God has disappeared. Where is he? Now, when you understand the trauma, when you understand the agony of Job's soul, do you see just how shallow someone like life is, is to Job? <laughs> hey, brother, praise the Lord. Come on, let's just seek God together. Now, listen. Sometimes that's the right advice, isn't it? Certainly it is. But not always. And certainly not in the situation of a man like Job, who was such a godly, righteous man, and who was now suffering such great affliction. And then Eliphaz turns into a preacher, right? Let me tell you how great our God is. And he starts, you know, starts singing how great thou art, almost, you know, with how wonderful God is. And Job is like, listen, I know God is that great. It's, it's almost as if Job's saying, I got no problem with God. What I'm afraid of is that God has got a problem with me. I feel abandoned by him. Where is he? And he just spells it out before life is. I have no idea what you're talking about. And he goes on and notice this. He gets even more pointed right here. Verse 17. Behold, happy is the man whom God corrects. Let me just pause right there. Could you imagine how that just felt like a dagger into Job's heart? Life is, you have no idea what I'm going through. You think I should just put on a smile and I'd be happy. Hey, 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 God's correcting me. Boy, you know, okay, Lord, what's that sin I committed? You know, that, that put me in this place of correction. Like this was a little spiritual spanking instead of a complete crisis and disruption of his life in every way imaginable. Plus, what do we know from the first two chapters? That it was not God's correction. This had nothing to do with God correcting Job. Now, let me make something clear. Before the end of the book, God has a little bit of correction to do with Job. And he's going to do it man to man, so to speak, with Job. But that's at the end of the book. But nothing that came upon Job came upon him because of God's correction. But you see how the friends assume that. All right, back to verse 17. Behold, happy is the man whom God corrects. Therefore, do not despise the chastening of the Almighty. For he bruises, but he binds up. He wounds, but his hands make whole. He shall deliver you in six troubles. Yes, in seven, no evil shall touch you. In famine, he shall redeem you from death. And in war, from the power of the sword, you shall be hidden from the scourge of the tongue. And you shall not be afraid of destruction when it comes. You shall laugh at destruction and famine. And you shall not be afraid of the beasts of the earth. For you shall have a covenant with the stones of the field. And the beasts of the field shall be at peace with you. You shall know that your tent is in peace. You shall visit your dwelling and find nothing amiss. You shall know that your descendants shall be many. And your offspring like the grass of the earth. And you shall come to the grave at a full age as a sheaf of grain ripens in its season. Can't you just see it? Can't you just see the nice music playing in the background? And here's the father surrounded by all his loving children. And there's the house and the garden and the birds are singing and all this. Oh, Job, this can be you again, Job. Just, just, just admit your sin and come back to the Lord. You know, come on. Even the, I love this where he says, and the beasts of the field shall be at peace with you. You know, a wolf will come up and say, oh, is it nice, Job? You know, isn't it great? And you just want to, now look, you read this. And the first thing that hits me is, you know, a, a life is, in a lot of ways, you're right. This is good and righteous counsel to give to many people, is it not? 
Isn't it true for somebody who is under the chastisement of the Lord, who is under the correction of the Lord? Isn't this what you should read to them? You should mark this in your Bible and say the next time I'm sort of praying with or discipling or counseling with somebody who's under correction from the Lord, this is a great passage to read to them, and it is great. The problem was not in his theology of God's correction. That was not the problem. The problem was in misapplying that theology to Job's particular situation. And that was the whole difficulty here with Elias. I, I, I just want to make one point out here when we take a look at some of these verses here. Verse 26, you shall come to the grave at a full age at a sheaf of, as a sheaf of grain ripens in season. Charles Spurgeon preached a great sermon on these particular words. These were his points and his uh, development regarding the death of a Christian. First of all, he said, this tells us that death is inevitable because it says you shall come. Secondly, it tells us that death is acceptable. You shall come. In other words, you'll arrive. Third, death is timely because it says at a full age. And finally, death is honorable as a sheaf of grain ripens in season. You could just see, well, yes, it's true. Yes, these are wise words misapplied. Look at the last part here, verse 27. Behold, this we have searched out. It is true. Hear it and know for yourself. You know, he's really trying to persuade Job. Oh, we all know this. Come on, we know this. Everybody around here in this little group that we have, we all know this. Let me point this out. It's not what Eliphaz knew that was wrong. It's what, what he was ignorant of. What he knew was correct. But what did he have no understanding of? He had no understanding of what was happening behind the curtain, right? Remember the curtain that we've talked about here? This invisible curtain that separates heaven and earth? Eliphaz had no clue what was happening behind that and this mysterious divine purpose that either Job or Eliphaz or Zophar or Bildad none of them had any understanding of what was going on beyond that and therefore he gave this kind of counsel I like what a man named Mason wrote about this commentator Mike Mason he said aspirin is a good and effective medicine but it is useless against cancer Similarly, so much of the advice that Eliphaz and the other friends dole out is, in its own right, correct and good and true. But because it is wrongly applied, it becomes useless. More than useless, it is a lie. You see, this is something that we really have to consider. The famous atheist Adolf Huxley said this. He said, I object to Christians they know too much about God. You know what? Wouldn't you say that that's the situation here with Elias? He's not a bad man, but he ends up doing a bad thing because he takes his wisdom and arrogantly, as it'll turn out, misapplies it. So that's how he concludes. Hear it and know for yourself. All right, well, what about Job's response here? <laughs> Chapter 6, verse 1. Then Job answered and said, Oh, that my grief were fully weighed, and my calamity laid with it on the scales, for then it would be heavier than the sand of the sea. Therefore my words have been rash, for the arrows of the Almighty are within me. My spirit drinks in their poison. The terrors of God are arrayed against me. Does the wild donkey bray when it has grass? Does the ox low over its fodder? Can a flavorless food be eaten without salt? Or is there any taste in the white of an egg? My soul refuses to touch them. They are as loathsome food to me. All right, now it begins. <laughs> Job gave his agonized cry. Eliphaz gave his best. You know, let me give you some advice. Here. I'll be your counselor here. Let me just tell you how to do it. And he spent two chapters doing that. And now Job is going to protest back. And this is where it really starts turning into a conflict between the friends. And you see, Job, oh, that my grief were fully weighed. Job's first response to the words of Eliphaz were to complain about the greatness of his suffering. 
You, you see, a life has only made his suffering worse with his well-intentioned but, but wrong analysis of Job's problem. So I said, you know, I thought I had a lot of problems. I thought it was bad that I lost all my wealth. I thought it was bad that I lost all my children. I thought it was bad that my own wife turned against me. I thought it was bad that I broke out with this horrible disease, and here I am in just sort of this strange filth and pain and discomfort and affliction. I thought all that was bad. But all you guys are worse. You're just making it worse upon me. And then he says, listen, I think this is very interesting that Job says this here in verse 3. Therefore, my words have been rash. Job will admit, hey, guys, listen, I know that when I spoke in chapter 3, I know that I was a little bit over the top. I know that my words were rash. But listen, it was because of the excessive heaviness of his grief. I think Job's friends should have just given him the permission to, to rage a little while. To, to just be miserable. I don't know. Sometimes maybe that's the greatest gift you can give to somebody. Is not try to fix it like his friends tried to fix Job. It's Job, we, we hurt with you. If you want to know how bad Job was hurting, take a look at this. You see, this gets to the core of his problem in verse 4 here. He says, For the arrows of the Almighty are within me. This is why Job's suffering was so deep and why his words were so rash back in chapter 3. It was because he felt that God himself had attacked him and cursed him. He felt that God had shot arrows at him and that God had sent poison against him and that God had arrayed his terrors against Job. You can just get the picture. He's like, here I am, I'm just a target for God and God's shooting arrow after arrow after arrow into me. He says, life is, you, you've got nothing for me. I love how he puts it there in verse 6. Can flavorless food be eaten without salt? This, this is how the words of Eliphaz tasted to Job. They were weak and flavorless, and they didn't give Job any health or any strength. Even before that, he says in verse 5, he says, does the wild donkey bray when it has grass? Listen, I've got reason for my grief, Job says. If everything's fine with the donkey, does the donkey cry out? No. He goes, listen, I'm crying out because something's wrong. Something's deeply wrong. And you guys don't seem to understand it. So here, verse 8. Oh, that I might have my request. That God would grant me the thing that I long for. That it would please God to crush me. That he would loose his hand and cut me off. Then... I would still have comfort. Though in anguish I would exult, he will not spare, for I have not concealed the words of the Holy One. Here Job is returning to the theme of his complaint in Job chapter 3, where he mourned the day of his birth, and he believed that he would be better off dead. Now Job never seemed to have contemplated suicide, but he wished that God himself would have ended his life. He said, oh, I wish that he would lose his hand and cut me off. You know what the picture is, I think, in my mind? I wonder if Job was thinking the same thing mentally in his picture. Here's Job, you know, sort of tied to a tree and shot full of arrows. Do you know those pictures of what is St. Sebastian, isn't it? Isn't he the one who's always pictured with arrows in him as this great Christian martyr? This 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 scene from, from art, you'll see it all over the place in museums and in, and in cathedrals and such. So here's Job, like St. Sebastian, filled with arrow after arrow, but he's not dead. And so now it's just, it's just crying to God, listen, you filled me full of arrows. Why don't you just finish me off? Why don't you just pump a couple more arrows into me and finish it? Because Job insists, I have not concealed the words of the Holy One. That's in verse 10. Job here again insisted on his basic innocence before God. The calamity in his life was not due to some sin, such as concealing the words of the Holy One. Or, or it, it might be better as it's translated in the New International Version here. The New International Version has this, that I had not denied the words of the Holy One. I didn't. Job says, I'm not guilty. The reason I'm in this situation is not because of some sin. Now, are you ready for Job just to kind of wail some more, right? Here he's not really arguing with these friends. He's just wailing. Verse 11, what strength do I have that I should hope? And what is my end that I should prolong my life? 
Is my strength the strength of stones? Or is my flesh bronze? Is my help not within me? And is success driven from me? Job here is reflecting on the sense of hopelessness that the severe and chronic sufferer has. He senses no inner strength whatsoever to meet his present challenge and the future challenges. He just feels no hope whatsoever. It's interesting that he says, is my help not within me? Now, Job is not like one of those motivational speakers. You know what I'm talking about when I say motivational speaker? You know, yes, you know, great things are within you. Possibility thinking, you know, the potential's there. Job isn't like one of these guys. No, not at all. Instead, these words come from this pain-racked man sitting on a burned-out place in a garbage dump. It indicates Job's absolute sense of helplessness. If Job's only place of help is within him, is my help not within me? If that's his only place of help, then he has no help. Again, what's the unsaid thing here? The unsaid thing is Job senses no help from God. Again, we'll touch on it repeatedly. But perhaps the most severe aspect of Job's trial was that he felt separated in fellowship from God. You know, isn't it true that, that if, the, if the light of the face of God shines upon you in glory and strength, and, and I don't want this to sound wrong, you'll know what I mean. You're like Superman, aren't you? You really are. When you sense the pleasure of the Lord upon you and his grace and his goodness is flowing through your life, you feel like you can do anything. I mean, David talks about that in the Psalms. You know, through my God, I can run against the truth. Through my God, I can leap over a wall. You know, he's Superman because God's smiling face is upon him. Job knew what that was like. He knew what that was like all the time in his life. But now he felt separated. So he felt like he had no hope. Now, verse 14, he's going to call out Eliphaz. To him who's afflicted, afflicted, kindness should be shown by his friend, even though he forsakes the fear of the Almighty. My brothers have dealt deceitfully like a brook, like the streams of the brooks that pass away, which are dark because of the ice and into which the snow vanishes. When it's warm, they cease to flow. When it's hot, they vanish from their place. The paths of their way turn aside. They go nowhere and perish. The caravans of Tima look. The travelers of Shibna hope for them. They're disappointed because they were confident, for they come there and are confused. For now you are nothing. You see terror and you're afraid. Did I ever say, bring something to me or offer a bribe for me from your wealth or deliver me from your enemy's hand or redeem me from the hand of the oppressors? You get the idea here? First, right, it's very clear. There's no mistaking what he says in verse 14. Kindness should be shown by his friend. Hey, the life is lighting up. I thought you were my friend. And then he says, my brothers have dealt deceitfully like a brook. You see, even though Eliphaz had previously spoken, Job addressed all three of his friends around there because he could probably sense that they were all in agreement. That Job was in this situation because of the sin in his life. He goes, you know what? Your wisdom, your help, it's like one of those brooks that flows, you know, for a little while, and then it's all dried up. Now, I don't know if you're familiar with that in this part of the world, but I can tell you where I grew up and lived for many years in California, we know exactly what that's like. You know, right outside of my town. Actually, there's, there's two rivers right where I grew up. There's the Ventura River and there's the Santa Clara River. One of them north of Ventura and one of them just south of Ventura. And you want me to tell you what you see in the Ventura River and in the Santa Clara River? Well, you hardly ever see water. What you just see is a dry riverbed, right? Sand, rock, whatever. Now, in the wintertime, when there's a lot of rains up in the hills and stuff, so you'll drive over the bridge and suddenly there's a river there. You go, wow, there's water there in the river. Well, Job says, you guys are just like one of these brooks. You flow for a little while and then you dry up and you're no good to anybody. The travelers come from afar and they look for water there and you can't help them at all or anything. And then he goes on, he goes, did I ever say, bring something to me? And Job wasn't asking his friends to pay him money or to ransom him from kidnappers. All he wanted was some words of comfort and he heard none from his friends. It's going to go on, verse 24. Teach me and I'll hold my tongue. Cause me to understand where I have erred. How forceful are right words. But what does your arguing prove? 
Do you intend to rebuke my words and the speeches of a desperate one which are as wind? Yes, you overwhelm the fatherless and you undermine your friend. Now therefore be pleased to look at me, for I would never lie to your face. Yield now, let there be no injustice. Yes, concede that my righteousness still stands. Is there injustice on my tongue? Cannot my taste discern the unsavory? See, Job believed that a life it was unduly harsh in his reply, and he failed to see that Job's rant recorded in chapter 3 was made up only of words from a desperate one. Did you notice that there? Do you intend to rebuke my words and the speeches of a desperate one, which are as wind? That's in verse 26. This man cut me a little bit of slack. So I ranted, so I raged, so I let it all out before God and you guys. Don't I have a little bit of room for that because of what I've suffered? You see, instead of comforting Job, Eliphaz was just as bad as someone who would overwhelm the fatherless and undermine his friend. Now, do you get the point here? See, this is where it gets a little bit ugly. Entertaining, but ugly. They're just insulting one another, right? No, not just. They're making arguments back and forth. But but pretty soon, it's just finger pointing. You're a terrible person. No, you're a terrible person. Well, you don't understand anything. Well, no, you don't understand anything. And it just kind of gets back and forth like that. It's more eloquent than that, but you kind of get the idea. Matter of fact, do you see the very end there at verse 30? Yes, concede, actually verse 29, I believe. Yes, concede my righteousness still stands. Job very much wanted Eliphaz and his other friends to see that his present calamity was not judgment from some grievous sin. I want you to notice this. The words that he repeated all over in that section, teach me, cause me, what does your arguing prove? Concede, all of these are demands for evidence and proof. It's as if he turns to Eliphaz and he says, listen, you say that I'm suffering because of sin, but you've never pointed out anything specifically. Teach me and tell me where my sin is. But until you do, there's no proof of your argument. Matter of fact, he goes, look, there's no injustice on my tongue. I can taste things. My taste can discern the unsavory. It's kind of interesting. It's as if he's saying, Eliphaz, your words to me were like food, food that tasted bad. And I'm going to spit it out of my mouth. We've got one more chapter to go here where Job is still replying to Eliphaz. But I want you to notice here that there's sort of a shift here, and this is common in Job's replies. Job here in chapter 7 is going to shift his focus to not speak to his friends anymore. Now he's going to talk to God. You know what's very, very interesting? For as wise and as eloquent and as blunt as sometimes Job's friends are, they never talk to God. Only Job talks to God. Isn't that kind of revealing? Doesn't that really show you Job's true godliness? Because even in the midst of this, even when he's talking to his friends, he does not forget to talk to God. Verse 1. Is there not a time of hard service for man on earth? Are not his days also like the days of a hired man, like a servant who earnestly desires the shade, and like a hired man who eagerly looks for his wages? So I have been allotted months of futility, and wearisome nights have been appointed to me. When I lie down, I say, when shall I arise and the night be ended? For I have had my fill of tossing till dawn. My flesh is caked with worms and dust. My skin is cracked and breaks out afresh. See, Job saw his present suffering like the futile, discouraging work of a servant or a hired man. He felt that there was no hope, no reward, only weariness. It's kind of interesting here. He says in 7.1, is not a time, is there not a time of hard service for man on earth? According to commentator Adam Clark and a few others, the phrase hard service is actually descriptive of military service. The Latin Vulgate translates it like this. The life of man is a warfare on the earth. You see, with this, Job was communicating both the idea of a struggle, right? Life is a struggle. It's a warfare. But also the idea 
He's a soldier who's just been drafted into this army, right? I didn't choose this, Job says. I've been drafted into this struggle on earth that's a warfare that I have to deal with now. Wearisome nights have been appointed to me. My flesh is caked with worms. Bad situation, right? Going on here now, verse 6. My days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle and are spent without hope. Oh, remember that my life is a breath. My eye will never again see good. The eye of him who sees me will see me no more. While your eyes are upon me, I shall no longer be. As the cloud disappears and vanishes away, so he who goes down to the grave does not come up. He shall never return to his house, nor shall his place know him any more. You know, when he says, my days are swifter than a weaver's shuttle, he didn't mean this in a positive sense. He didn't mean, wow, my, look how fast time's going by. No, that's not the idea at all. As described in the previous verses, the season of affliction is dragging by for Job. No, the idea here is that uh, it's moving fast like a weaver's shuttle, but actually there's a very subtle thing in the Hebrew here that is basically saying that the thread is running out. It's an overtone in meaning. It can't be reflected well, but the idea really, what Bob's gives is, is it's like they're weaving and the thread's running out. My life is about at an end. And then he says, did you notice that there? So he who goes down to the grave does not come up. That's in verse 9. Now again, we talked about this before, right? Job's lack of knowledge of the world beyond. And Job is going to confuse us on this. I'll just break it to you right now. Later on in the book of Job, we're going to come to some of the most dramatic and triumphant declarations of faith in the world beyond that we find in some of the uh, Old Testament. But, But in other places, Job goes, look, man, the grave, that's it. You're dead, you're gone. He's conflicted. He doesn't really know. Going on here now, verse 11. Therefore, I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Am I a sea or a sea serpent that you set a guard over me? When I said my bed will comfort me, my couch will ease my complaint, then you scare me with dreams and terrify me with visions so that my soul chooses strangling and death rather than my body. I loathe my life. I would not live forever. Let me alone for my days are but a breath. Again, you hear him crying out to God here, right? Man, this is dramatic. It's as if Job was saying, you know, Eliphaz and these friends of mine, they just want me to shut up. They just want me to stop talking about how hard this is. And he says, well, I'm not going to shut up. And I'm going to cry out to you, God. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. Am I a sea or a sea serpent that you set a guard over me? God, am I so scary to you that you're doing this to me? Job cried out to God. He said, listen, God, I'm not some dangerous creature that you should treat me this way. You know, we hear of people sometimes being shadowed by the police, right? You see it in movies all the time. Follow this guy. Don't let him know you're there. But overlook him all the time. Some people feel like they're being shadowed by God. They're being mysteriously tracked by the Holy Spirit. And they know it. They feel it. They they feel that God's eye is upon them everywhere they go. This is how Job felt, but it wasn't a pleasant sense. It wasn't like, oh, his eye is on me all the time. It's like, listen, he's watching me. Listen, we're, we're here confronted with this, with this great agony that Job has. He cries out to God, you scare me with dreams. Job was even denied the comfort of sleep and rest. When he finally did fall asleep, upon his bed or his couch. Then he was disturbed with nightmarish dreams and terrifying visions. So much so that his soul chooses strangling. I loathe my life. Job was so miserable that it just said to God, let me alone. Just leave me alone, God. But he's not done. Verse 17. 
What is man that you should exalt him, that you should set your heart on him, that you should visit him every morning and test him every moment? How long? Will you not look away from me and let me alone till I swallow my saliva? Have I sinned? What have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why do you set me as your target so that I am a burden to myself? Why then do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now I will lie down in the dust and you will seek me diligently, but I will no longer be. What Job is going through is very complex, isn't it? On the one hand, he's grieved. God, where are you? God, where are you? But the other thing he feels is that God, leave me alone. Now look, it seems to contradict itself, doesn't it? But if you live through even just a shadow of that, you know what Job's talking about. God, I I sense your presence, but I don't sense your love. I I sense you're there, but I feel like you're watching me like the police might watch me. That's a very, very uncomfortable feeling. What is man that you should exalt him and test him every moment? And then he says, oh, this is so dramatic how he says this here. Uh, Where is it there in verse uh, 20, uh, 20. What have I done to you, O watcher of men? Please, God, just leave me alone. How have I wronged you? Job could not understand why he seemed to be God's target. And if Job had sinned to cause all the suffering, then he asked God, why then do you not pardon my transgression? Did did you see that there, verse 21? Why then do you not pardon my transgression? God, if this is all because of my sin, why don't you just forgive it? I love you, I've served you. Job was so honest with God that certain passages like Job 7.20 seem to have been altered by Jewish scribes who were uncomfortable with Job's bold honesty with God. This is according to one commentator named Smick. He says, Ancient scribal tradition and the Septuagint showed that the original reading to have been, Have I become a burden to you? Most translations following the later Hebrew manuscripts have it, I am a burden to myself. Yet the probable original text shows how deep Job's grief is, feeling himself to be a burden to what feels like an unloving and uncaring God. Job wondered why God bothered with him at all. Now again, you and I read this. And we read it with an understanding that Job didn't have. We read chapters 1 and 2. We know there's a reason. We know there's a plan. We know there's a strategy. We know there's a wonderful heart of God's love behind this that looks at Job and says, Job, you're one of my heroes. You're one of my mighty men on the earth. But Job can't see it at all. Spurgeon wrote this. Job was not being punished. He was being honored. God was giving to him a name like that of one of the great ones of the earth. The Lord was lifting him up, promoting him, putting him into the front rank, making him a great saint, causing him to become one of the fathers and patterns in the ancient church of God. He was really doing for Job such extraordinary good things that you or I, in looking back upon this whole history, might well say, I would have been quite content to take Job's afflictions if I might also have Job's grace and Job's place in the church of God. Isn't it true? We look at that and we go, man, Lord, if I could have what you gave to Job and what you blessed Job with and what you worked into his soul, then maybe I would receive those afflictions. But here's the thing, you can't understand that in the moment of it. Job's moment of it, he's blind, he's groping, he's wondering where God is. And then he says, it's just, 
kind of, you read verse 21, you almost want to cry. Verses 20 and 21 are some of the most deeply pathetic in the whole book. Let me read 20 and 21 to you again. Have I sinned? What have I done to you, O watcher of men? Why have you set me as your target so that I am a burden to myself? Why then do you not pardon my transgression and take away my iniquity? For now I will lie down in the dust and you will seek me diligently, but I will no longer be. It's as if he just wished he could escape both life and God by going into the dust that is his grave. This is one of the obviously pessimistic passages about the afterlife. All Job has known about God from before. He still believes it. But God's unexplainable ways have put Job's mind and his soul at the breaking point. Job is in the right, but he doesn't know that God is watching him with silent compassion and admiration until the test is finally done and then God will gloriously reveal himself to him. Until then, Job just has to hang in there. You know, we like to talk about having the faith to be healed, right? And I believe in that. I believe God wants to heal people. And I believe there are people who are not healed because they don't have enough faith. It's a good thing, the faith to be healed. You know what Job needed in this situation? What we need sometimes? We need to have the faith to be sick. And just wait on the Lord in the midst of it all. Father, just thank you for showing us this picture tonight of this man and his very real, his very raw relationship with you. Lord, I confess before you and before my brothers and sisters that I I cannot relate in any way to the depth and the severity of Job's suffering. But I thank you, Lord, that you teach me and you teach each one of us along the same principles. Help us to trust you mightily and securely, even in the midst of things we can't understand. And Lord, give us wisdom and true sympathy in ministering to others who are afflicted and who are suffering. We pray this, Lord God, in Jesus' name. Amen.